Hello ladies and gentlemen, Konoji here. Welcome back to Automation, continuing on in our light campaign slash career with the Vector Car Company. And we have started to design our first supercar. We'll take a look at it here. It is what I think is a looker, but there's some refining we need to do before we sign any papers. We haven't even gotten as far as looking into the factory setup yet. But I do think there's some small tweaks I need to make with the car. And a lot of those have to do with the way it's stacking up in the market right now. I have increased its base price up to 100% in order to get it to be into the super hyper uh, main categories. Which is where I want to be because that is where the, that's where the prestige is. We, we need to build our name not sell a lot of cars, we need to have something that people will go, that is the coolest supercar I've ever seen. Uh, which, <laughs> as a as a nine-year-old, I thought the Vector M12 that was at a car show was the coolest car I'd ever seen. In reality, it was actually, you know, pretty poorly made underneath, uh, but it had a huge price tag, it had the looks, it had, debatably, performance, uh, and it gave that impression. There was a lot of other mistakes that the, the real quote-unquote vector made, but we're going to try and avoid those. All right, so 100% markup is a thing. It's possible uh, we could make more money off of every car. Money is not really our main concern for the first model years, though. We have a $4 billion budget. Our main concern is to get a good amount of reputation built up, uh, get some uh, market infiltration going. So let's go back to the... Actually, I'm going to go back to the engine first. And I'm going to increase the quality on some of this stuff. Because I really didn't use any of the quality sliders to begin with. And that is my typical automation building style. So I'll make a baseline car without using the quality sliders to really cheat anything. Uh, but now we're going to... And it's not really cheating. I'm just saying it's, you know... Uh, you have to use the quality sliders to get the advantage in certain places. I'm going to use it in here on the top end and a little bit on the bottom end because we were actually having some quality issues uh, with the bottom end, with the crank specifically. And then here, where we want to be improving in the future our fueling system, we will throw a bunch of quality at it, especially since it's a carburetor and a carbureted setup. I want to check the loudness and make sure it's not too loud. It's not too loud. It might actually be nearing too quiet, which is really fine. Uh, more, more quality here would actually make it louder. But I think we're okay there. I don't want to just waste money. But I do want to spend it so that uh, we have something that's, that's worth noting. And on the plus side, out of that, we were able to squeak another 10 horsepower or so out of this thing. That will only help. So let's move on into the chassis side of things. And in the transmission, there's not a lot going on there. Uh, in the tires, we had given it some quality. But we can actually probably even increase that some. Have some super high quality wheels and tires on here. And in brakes, super high quality. I hadn't even touched the braking quality. So front brakes and rear brakes are performing at about the same level, and that level is far above the necessary amount of braking force the car needs, which isn't a terrible thing. It could be a, a matter of having a little bit extra rotor weight on there. That's a possibility, uh, but overall, it's not terrible, and we are still facing a little bit of brake fade. Here we have adequate cooling, more than adequate cooling, so no real problems there. But we can actually improve the efficiency of the body. We can make it slimmer, make it uh, more aerodynamic, and make better downforce. On the interior, I went with sport. Should we go with luxury? That's a question. Uh, it certainly improved the super happiness but not really the track premium. That's not really the one I want. I want to get hyper in there. Let me do that real quick. Markets, change this tack to this tack. There we go. And move back to here. Okay, hyper is at 84.7 and 97%. So our, uh, the, the price point is still very good. 
it's the actual desirability that we need to improve upon. So does luxury help that? Mildly does, actually. Uh, handmade makes them both significantly better, though. So even though, in my mind, I would want my super slash hypercar to have a quote-unquote sporty interior, handmade still fits the category better. And handmade doesn't mean it can't be sporty. It just means that it's, you know, handcrafted materials and stuff like that. <laughs> and what do you know? In 1980, a luxury 8-track is what the people really want. You know, I'm not going to drive this... This super fast, awesome, loud, exotic hypercar, unless it has a luxury 8-track that only screws up half of my cassettes. Were they called cassettes? Maybe they were just called 8-tracks. I don't know. We can increase quality in here as well. And that would actually reduce weight, I believe, possibly. Uh, either way, oh, it's actually increasing weight, but increasing the desirability of the interior. All right, so this was all... A real healthy change, I believe. I think we've we've taken this car from something it was struggling to be into something that it actually is, just through those minor changes. Now in the markets, you see there is a much narrower market for this car. However, the the categories that it excels in, it's really, really excelling in. Is a hundred percent markup too much? Possibly. We'll have to see as we get into the factory stuff. Speaking of the factory stuff, let's go ahead. I think I'm happy with the car. I really do think I am happy with the car. Let me double check some things. Okay, because I was making changes, random things may change. So we added weight. Now the handling's a little bit of a concern again. So a little bit of fine tuning will be necessary. And because I never ran this thing on any of the tracks or anything like that, let's just see what it does around the airfield track. Uh, we won't sit here and watch the whole thing, but we'll give it a listen. Yeah, it kind of sounds like <laughs> most flat plane, or sorry, cross plane V8s. What kind of time does it put down? A 123.91. Not uh, not too shabby. 1.04 and 1.07 on the skid pads. That's really good. Uh, the quarter mile is a 13.5. Top speed 168. 0 to 62 is... 5.3 seconds. Not a slow car by 1980 standards. I am pretty happy with all of that. So now, let's go ahead and move into the the back end of the company, the factories, and all of that good stuff. This would be my first time doing this on my own, so let's see what we can do here. Uh, first thing I'm seeing is the total engineering time as of right now is five years and two months. That might be a little too long. By 1985, our competitors, I think, are going to be uh, a little too far ahead of where we're at. So I need to try and get that down. And let's see. Let's increase funding on this, which should decrease the amount of time. All right, so increasing funding up to 80, got us down to four years, 10 months. Reliability starts at 50. There is not currently too much of a risk of having a non-reliable car, and I'm not too worried about that as of right now. So 50 is maybe where we'll just leave that. And um, let's move on, let's look at the engine. So total engineering time on the engine is five years. 11 months, obviously we need those two to be pretty close together. Uh, we don't necessarily need to finish it any sooner than that though. On the engine side, we have me. So I can choose me <laughs> and that will reduce the amount of engineering time on the engine, uh, which will in theory let us save some money. Wait, how long did the car take? The car takes four years, ten months. The engine takes five years, eight months. So I need a lot of funding on this engine, all the funding on the engine, and maybe even reduce the reliability just to get it down so it's around the same time. We don't want the car sitting around waiting for, uh, for the engines to be done. So in this, there is risk. There is the risk that we did not design a vehicle that is five years ahead future-proof. That's the risk we're going to have to try and take here. But moving on, so in here, oh, this is 
this is very different. This is a much different screen than I'm used to. Uh, we're going to be in the region of Gensmea on a small plot size, I believe. Well, we could go up to a medium. We have the money to buy the medium. Gives us a little bit of future proofing. All right, so we want to, I guess, buy those. Sure. Now, this is just the car factory. And then we need to assign this one. Car, medium, gives me a assign. Uh, assign. Okay, assign went away. So I guess that's that's good. But we need an engine factory yet. Uh, and this is different. Okay, this is the engine factory. Got it. All right. Sorry, I'm learning this as we go here. So we want to buy. We have a medium... Uh, car factory, but a small engine factory should be good enough. We could go up to the medium uh, for the plot size. No, I don't think we're ever going to be personally building that many cars. So let's buy small. That may be a mistake, but we'll see. We're learning. We're learning. All right. So the next tab. Aha, this is where we can actually see it. Uh, we can name it. I guess this is the vector plant. There we go. This is where we choose the size of the factory itself. Uh, we will need steel presses for our car. So we can increase the automation of this factory and give us more cars at lower cost, less staff. But it's also uh, more money to do it that way. But that is, you know, a good thing. You get good, reliable cars that way. And the tooling quality is basically just what you... See there, lower production cost, higher production output. So the better tools you get, the better cars you get, the faster cars you get, all that good stuff. And we're going to do small and a one small on this because this this will be a very low production car. We haven't signed off on anything yet, but we may need to. We'll see. Okay, so now let's look at our... This is the Vector Car Factory. It would currently be making nine cars per day at maximum. And... Uh, it would be staffing 324 people. Our tiny engine factory would only make four engines per day, so we may need a small, and then uh, I guess just, you would just be able to not make that many in the future. That's how it used to work. We'll see if that's still how it works. Uh, let's go to this last tab. No, this has actually been simplified a bit too, hasn't it? Oh yeah, this is this is the same screen, but yeah. This is, a, I'm very pleased with the changes of the order of these tabs and whatnot. This is all uh, making much more sense than it used to. So currently in car production, 9.3. And then in engine production, let's see. Engines, 9.3. Required, 9.3. So either, either the engines are what's limiting the cars. Or, or the... <laughs> No! Crashed. All right, well, this has been a lesson in always save your games, especially when you're playing in open betas. <laughs> All right, well, I've gone back and rebuilt the car. Let me now save it. And now we'll all go back through this. Uh, I'll try to get back to where we were. All right, so in the base settings, we would be making 9.3 cars per shift or per day. And we can reduce that by decreasing the amount of shifts. So if we go down to like 1.5, we can produce 7 a day. Uh, and then we're going to click Next and hope that the game doesn't crash. Okay, it didn't crash this time. And then uh, you can click this button, Match to Car, and it will do that. So we're producing 7 inches. 7 inches? 7 engines for our 7 cars. And then we can move on from there. And we can save now that we've finally made it to this point and see that 55,000, so we actually dropped in price a little bit with a 100% markup, and we're still doing really, really good uh, for 1980, for 1980, keep that in mind, in these three categories, convertible, super, which I guess this is a Targa, so it's sort of going to convertible, uh, super, and hyper, also a little bit in GT Premium, and a shade in some of these other guys that we might pick up a sale or two in. Uh, I find it unlikely. <laughs> we might struggle to sell any of them. I am not sure yet. So, 
what are these next tabs? We have this one, which is a new logo to me. Oh, okay, yep, that's the same tab we are familiar with in the past. So, in Gizmea and Fruinia, we have... Fruinia? Sure. <laughs> we have the, uh, the number of cars that are prognosticated. That's a word to sell this trim in this region. So basically how many cars they're, they're saying we're gonna sell in the current time, the current markets. Not the market that it will actually be engineered in, uh, but in the current market, 33. And in the uh, Kismea, our home region, 156. Now this is the ratio of demand divided by production. Values above one mean you will be able to sell more than your factories are set to produce. So, Basically, at this point, in Gazmea, we are overproducing cars. So, we would have a, a backup supply of cars. Uh, now, in Fruinia, we're never probably going to have that to be, a, be an amount that we could uh, overwhelm it with. However, I guess we would have to add the two. That's an important thing I should have asked somewhere down the lines, and I guess I will ask you right now. Uh, is the total sum of these two, the amount of cars that we're producing. So if it's uh, now going to be 90, so 0.9%. Hmm, that's a good question that I don't know the answer to. What is this here? Shifts. The adjust the overall car production, automatically adjust the engine production within limits. Okay, so we could limit this down to somewhere where we would have a issue where we we actually don't have enough cars to sell and that is the way I want to have it. I want to have it so that we sell all of the cars we produce and the odds are that we won't actually sell as many as it's saying because it's going to take so long to actually produce the car. As of right now there is a hundred and seventy one cars made per month. As of right now, I'm seeing a cars per month of 171. I think that means the prospective sales, not per prospective amount made. I'm not sure. Uh, if it is, then it's real close. If that's the amount that are going to be made, which I guess does make sense. Uh, production split. I don't 100% know what that means, but I guess we're only producing it in Gizman, so maybe that's what that's going for. We could, in theory, lower the price in Fruinia to try and sell more there. Uh, that's not going to help our reputation any, so we're going to keep it right where it was at. 0%. So we'll sell at the same price into both locations. Alright, the next screen. The next screen is the big scary check mark. Big scary check mark. Because this gives us the big start button. But let's look at things here. So the cost breakdown of this, the grand total is $708 million. That is not very much. Uh, when you look at the fact that we're starting with $4 billion, this is not a extremely risky maneuver that we're doing. The profit of it is extremely low, and that is fine with me. I'm okay with having never being able to break even on this car. I don't expect to break even on this car. All I do, all I expect is to be able to uh, infiltrate the market with it. But if we kept producing it and it kept selling, it would break even in 1998. That is unlikely to ever happen. The profit per month is 4.3 million. So at least we're making a profit on it. At least we're not losing money on it per month. Um, but overall, we're going to be losing money on it. We're never going to sell $708 million worth of profit of these cars. That, that's just a reality of it. So the actual here, the actual price of the car is $27,801 to produce. We are selling them for, I think, $55,000, something like that. So we're making a healthy profit. Uh, just to, depends on how many we actually sell. And uh, we have the ability to ramp it up should they actually sell better than expected. That's a possibility. And then up here, taking this all in the wrong order, as I do, the engineering time. So we'll start engineering it the 1st of 1980, January 1980. We'll start producing or start tooling them in April of 1983 and start production in October of 1984. 
Let's do this. What's the worst that could happen? Everything's terrible. No, uh, we haven't even started, actually. So, basically, nothing happens until I hit play. Are we ready to hit play and see what happens? I will uh, probably advance it to 1984 uh, whenever it is ready to be started. First year summary, we lost $284 million. Just producing the car, or just engineering the car. Okay, that's fine. Second year, only 106 million that year. You know, not too bad. Another 106 million down the drain. All right, here we go. 1 1 1984. We're getting close to actually selling some cars. Let's see when that starts to happen. Oh, there we go. Things are happening. We are making and selling cars. We've sold a total of 224 in our first year. Our reputation went down. 1.31 our prestige went up 1.16 so that's good i uh i'm glad that our prestige has come up uh, i'm wondering why the reputation came down which uh was kind of unexpected okay pause and let's look at let's look at some things here all right sales 2.3 out of a possible 16 in convertible super 28 of 42 in super one of a possible 1.7 in Hyper. GT Premium, 20 of 42. That's a surprise. I didn't expect to uh, do as well there. And apparently we've sold somebody the front bumper of one so far in Luxury Premium. But let's look at Awareness. And that should be Super and Hyper. You can see they've come up 1.1. So 31.1, 31.1. Come up a little bit in GT Premium. We're getting there with that. And here in market, the Super and Hyper are still on the climb right now, which is good. Uh, the economy, staying level. There's, I see a little dip in it. Commercial is on its way up. Luxury is on its way up. That's good news for us. That's really good news for us, as it's premium. So all of this is good. A dip in budget is a good thing to see for a supercar manufacturer. So that, all of this is really encouraging, actually. Um, I'm going to play out one full more year and see how the sales continue to go through 1985 and into 1986. And then at 1986 is when we'll probably be looking at uh, maybe doing some changes. All right, our total sold now is 302. We have 328 in stock, so we have plenty of stock. We could probably end production on this thing pretty early and uh, just sell off the stock for quite some time. Unless people, you know, just refuse to buy them. That's always a possibility in the grand scheme of things. Uh, I am slightly concerned about that becoming a possibility as we now have more stock in them than we have sold in total. But it's still coming up. It's still selling pretty well. 470, 475. It's not doing too bad. All right, another month. Our reputation continues to plummet, but our prestige continues to increase. I will be very glad to hear some, uh, some, you know, advice on reputation, or if that's just, you know, the norm for a new car manufacturer, uh, or perhaps I'm having some reliability issues with the car. That's probably something most common with uh, new startup supercar manufacturers, to be honest. All right, it's starting to pick up some momentum now that we're getting some prestige. People are starting to take notice of us. The awareness is coming up. Oh, look at that, 34.5 and a hyper and super. Yeah, people are starting to really take notice to us. We've now sold more cars than we have in stock. And that number, the offset's starting to become pretty severe. So uh, we're heading in a good direction. And we're making a profit. I mean, the balance sheets and graphs, none of this is going to look very good for now. Uh, but we do see that income is coming up, so this car, like I said, is not going to be the one to make us money, but it's at least not losing us money as we're selling it. We're now up to 1,300 cars sold, which is far greater than I expected. Let me pause that there. We're now in 1986, one year before I am born, and we have started to make a profit. Our prestige has come up 6.33 reputation continues to plummet which is a shame but 
we'll just have to see what we can do about that in future models. And uh, yeah, let's keep that paused and take a look at some things at the end here. Economy continues to improve for us. We are, <laughs> we got really lucky here. The luxury market is skyrocketing right now. Uh, it's doing very well. It's actually, if we look at the history, you know, of the market, we're probably at a point where the next three or four years are going to be the high, and then we're going to be going through a low. But that's okay. At least we're starting on a high. Awareness is coming up. We are starting to see a little bit of color here, a little bit of green in super and hyper. Not so much in GT Premium. And the market, again, continues to increase in Super and Hyper. So this is all very good news. Now, Infruenia, uh, it's actually a similar story. Looks like, just on a smaller scale. Wow, their luxury is really on the climb. Makes me wonder if maybe we should have produced more for Fruinia. But that's okay. R&D is going to town. Hopefully that means by the time we produce our next car, we'll have some quality points to spend, quote-unquote, for free on those cars, which will be good. Oh, an exception error. <laughs> do you wish to report this error? Ah, uh, yes, I do. There we go. And continuing on, familiarity. We're getting familiarity and a lot of things here. But it looks like some things are maybe missing from this whole screen here, so maybe don't look at it so hard. <laughs> don't, don't look. Don't look, I'm hideous. Uh, okay, back to production. There's where we stand. How do you think I'm doing? I think I'm pretty happy with how this has gone so far. Uh, we're not exactly setting the world on fire, but we're getting our name out there. I think for a startup supercar company in 1980, to be making a profit by 1986 isn't too bad. All right, well, that will do it for today. I will be looking for a little bit of guidance here. Where do we go from this point? Do we, do we just play it out, let this car produce itself out? Do we make a new car right now? Do we, uh, do we try to get ahead of the, the curve here and start engineering a new replacement model for this uh, at the moment? And I'll have to think about, you know, what is the next step from here? You know, we've already produced what I think is a, uh, a pretty good hypercar. But is it a good hypercar for the 90s? Maybe not. So maybe that's the direction we go next. Or do we produce something less or more expensive? So many choices. And we'll have to figure out them next time here in Automation.